All right, welcome back to another installment of the Wide Ride Podcast. I'm Manny Navarro, Miami Hurricanes beat writer for The Athletic. Today is Thursday. What is? What are we on? February third, uh, 23rd, around 3.30 p.m. Uh, Mario Cristobal, as we talked about in our previous podcast a week ago, already hired his offensive coordinator, got that done, hired Shannon Dawson from Houston. Um, I had uh, one of my colleagues from The Athletic on with me to talk about that. Actually, two of my colleagues. Um, Sam Khan was actually on the uh, YouTube page with me last week talking about the, the, the Shannon Dawson hire. He's based out of Houston, uh, graduated from Houston, so he follows that program well. And then, um, you know, I had uh, Bruce Feldman on with me as well on the on the audio version of the podcast. So hopefully you guys got a chance to check that out uh, in the last podcast. But today I got Carlos Leather, the MIA All Day podcast, back with me because I wanted to get Carlos' thoughts on the hires. Uh, being a football X's and O's guy like he is, um, I figured... Uh, Use that term loosely. I can use it loosely, but, uh, you know, you, you know, hurricane history, you know, hurricane coaching, um, you know, going to the air raid, quote unquote air raid, even though it's not really the air raid uh, <laughs> and really more of an aggressive defense uh, with Lance Gidry as the defensive coordinator. Uh, they also hired Derek Nicholson as linebackers coach. And then earlier this week, uh, Tim Harris Jr. was hired away from uh, UCF to be uh, the running backs coach. So four hires still need a receivers coach. I know that that could be getting close to being finalized here. I'm sure as soon as we're done with this podcast, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be announced who the receivers coach is. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to dispel any rumors, it's not me. All right, good. I want people to know that. Um, I, first, we'll get your thoughts on that, um, Carlos, in a second. But I want to tease a couple of things. I wrote a story earlier this week on uh, Prentice Air Nolan. He's a four-star quarterback out of Georgia. He's one of about six or seven quarterbacks Miami has on its board I'll share some but, names. But I guarantee you that is the best nickname of all the quarterbacks are recruiting right now. Well, it's not even a nickname. It's his middle name. It's his actual middle Air name. Air is his birth- middle name? Air is his middle name on his birth certificate. Dude, listen. Uh, tell Ruiz to write a check for whatever it takes. That guy's going to be <laughs> legit. I don't care what's <laughs> – that kid from birth has been destined to be amazing. So write the check. Um, I got some names to share as far as Miami's board that we'll get into later. We got mailbag questions. But, Carlos, let's start with just your thoughts on, on the overall theme of Mario's hires here. Yeah, um, it's pretty interesting that he went with, you know, uh, a defensive guy who's a little bit more aggressive than Kevin Steele and Lance Gidry, a guy that brings more pressure, a guy that goes more man. Um, you know, his base coverages are cover one, uh, cover three, and then a, a variation of what they call cover four, which is a cover four palms, which is a matchup man kind of cover four, um, which is sort of a 180 from what they were doing with Kevin Steele, where they played a lot of base defense, didn't send a lot of blitzes, tried to stay, uh, you know, fundamentally sound and make plays that way and play a lot of zone behind it. Um, and really that's what they were doing before they, they hired Mario Cristobal, right? They had an aggressive defense. They'd like to get guys upfield. Um, in, in Gidry's defense, it seems as though he keeps a little bit more lane integrity when he pushes up the field with his defensive line and on pressures than Manny did, but it's essentially the same thing. They like to get upfield, change the line of scrimmage, push it backwards, make the offense have to work to get across the line of scrimmage and then attack the football and be aggressive with it and play more man. So it's a 180 there on defense. And then offensively, you're essentially bringing Rhett Lashley back because again, Remember when Rhett Lashley was first hired, it was the combination of the air raid passing game coming from Sonny Dykes and the power run game coming from Gus Malzahn, who was a huge influence on Rhett Lashley's career coming up. So that was supposed to be the marriage that we got with Rhett Lashley. Now, when Lashley got here, um, we came a little bit, there was a kind of a codependent relationship on De'Eric King, a lot like you saw in Houston last year with Shannon Dawson and Clay Toon, where Clay Toon was basically the offense. You know, he was their leading rusher, leading passer, did it all for them. Um, and really that running game, that power spread never developed. And I think a lot of that had to do with one, not enough talent in the running back room and had a lot of injuries while uh, Rhett Lashley was here. And two, the offensive line just wasn't good enough to be pinning and pulling and moving. So they had to use a lot more inside zone. So to me, ideally, what we're going to get is what we thought we were going to get originally with Rhett Lashley and Manny Diaz a couple years ago, now with Mario Cristobal. Yeah, and you're going to get Mario Cristobal type players here coming in. I, I think in some respects, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, Carlos, it's almost like he's acquiescing to what he has in terms of the talent, right? In his backyard, what he has in terms of the talent um, on the roster at the moment. Um, you know, how, how long how long they play this style? You know, how many years is, is the Mario Cristobal era going to be? you know, this same offense all the way through? Is it going to be the same style defense all the way through? I don't know that. I don't know that this any of any marriages in college football that long. 
um, you know, or anymore last that long. I mean, in the end, coaches have to constantly sort of reinvent themselves and reinvent what they're doing based on the personnel they have. But I think that the encouraging sign is that Mario made adjustments after coming here. And, and I've said this on, on this podcast several times, and I've said this to you, you know, I feel like when Mario was out on the West Coast, he really didn't know what was going on here. And I think it was a little bit of an eye opener, as it is for every coach in college football. You end up in a new place. You have to adapt to what that, that environment is and try to change it while you're there. Um, I think Mario's trying to do that, um, had to change the coaching staff, had to make some, 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 you know, not just from a scheme perspective, but I would say just from a thought process perspective, right. Bringing in hungry coaches, guys that need to prove themselves. Uh, Tim Harris jr. You know, was at FIU for most of his career was at UCF for one year as an assistant head coach. He's a hungry young coach. Um, you know, he, he wants to prove himself. He hasn't been at the power five level for multiple years. Derek Nicholson, former Florida state linebacker, uh, you know, he was on the staff at, at Louisville. Yes, he was coaching with Scott Satterfield, followed him to Cincinnati. But again, is he at a blue blood program? No, he, he really hasn't been there yet. Um, Shannon Dawson was at Houston. You know, again, he's he's sort of been under the wing of Dana Holgerson over there. Now this is his moment to come out and shine. Lance Guidry, former head coach at McNeese State, hasn't gotten the opportunity really to coach at the power five level. Been at Marshall, been at other places, but this is his first. So it's a different perspective also, I think, from a mentality standpoint, right? You're not bringing in Kevin Steele, who's been at, at, at major Power Five programs, or Charlie Strong, who's been at major Power Five programs in the NFL, or Kevin Smith, uh, you know, who, who was at Ole Miss with Lane Kiffin for a few years. I think it's a different mentality, and, and, a, and it's probably necessary for the type of kids that you have at the moment. Yeah, and, and it's interesting to see, you know, it, like like you said, it's a complete 180 on the entire program, not just the offensive and defensive philosophy, but in terms of the coaches they hired and how they're going to be coaching these kids. I, I think what ended up happening is when Mario came into the program, one, he thought, man, they weren't that bad over the last couple of years. I think we can just plug and play here and there, build up the program while we start bringing in our recruits, have a decent season and start building right away. Then when he got here, he realized that wasn't the case. I think the second thing that happened is, when the resources were available to Mario and he was able to write blank checks to whatever coaches he wanted, I think he focused too much on getting the biggest names he could possibly get, guys with proven track records, guys that he felt would be immediate impacts because of their resume, and didn't really get to know these guys and where they were in their career and how they were in terms of you know their their work ethic with the players, their their coaching style. And it was really more about the names. And he thought that maybe that would be a great way to build a super staff and get the best results, but ultimately it backfired for many reasons. And where he's had success is doing what he did at FIU, right? Identifying coaches that he feels are talented and hungry that are not getting the opportunity right now that he feels are going to be bigger names down the road and getting them in the program now. So as they rise, the program rises with them, right? So this could be their stepping stone to the next level. And that's what he wants. And that's what he built in other places, just like at Oregon. You know, Marcus Arroyo wasn't a household name when he became the offensive coordinator at Oregon ended up being the, the head coach at UNLV. He had other assistants that he hired at, at, at other places, at, at Oregon, at FIU, that want, went on to big things like Frank Ponce, like James Coley, like Todd Orlando, guys like that. Um, you know, this guy just got fired as a head coach at, at Georgia Tech. His name escapes me right now, who was a great defensive coordinator for him at FIU and other places. So he's going back to his roots. And I think it was a little bit shell-shocking for him to see the way this season played out not just because of the way the players played, but because of the way the coaches coached and the way things went on. So he had to make a decision, either, you know, roll with what we got and see if we could work it out or just cut bait now, admit the mistake and go back to with, to, to his fundamentals, the way he feels programs should be built. And I think he did that. He did. And, uh, and so now we'll see. I, I still think there's probably going to be more changes. You know, Bruce Feldman, who works with me at The Athletic, is as plugged in as anybody as far as, uh, Mario's coaching changes and, and thought process. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think he's mentioned, he mentioned some of the uh, receivers coaches. I mentioned it as well. I thought Kevin Beard would be a good candidate for this job being at Toledo, being in an, in a pass heavy system over there for several years, having worked at Miami, played at Miami. I think he understands the culture. And, and sort of a little, a little dig at Jason Candle for turning down the job two years in a row. Let me take a receiver's coach. This is what you get for right, turning me down. Right, right. The Miami Herald reported that Leonard Hankerson actually interviewed for the job. Bruce Feldman two weeks ago mentioned Leonard Hankerson as a potential guy that Mario wanted to get. He also mentioned Reggie Wayne. Uh, so, you know, we'll see what happens here with the receiver's coach position. Hopefully it gets filled soon. Uh, spring practice starts March 4th, and you want all these coaches in there. But I will tell you, I mean, it, it, Mario will, will take it right up until the gun. I mean, I, I remember in fall camp last year, 
Uh, there were questions about whether or not Stephen Field was going to come back and be the tight ends coach. Well, he signed his contract literally, I think, the first day of practice. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this can go all the way up. The bottom line is you have your offensive and defensive coordinators. That's the most important thing. You can move assistant coaches around. And, and the other thing I'd say is, you know, college football is allowing more and more coaches to be on the sideline involved. Um, so, you know, like Demarcus Van Dyke, does he need to be one of the 10 assistant coaches? No, not necessarily. He's on the field. He's helping out. He's recruiting. He's doing a lot of different things. So there's more flexibility in college football as far as keeping people happy. Uh, you know, DVD did interview for some jobs. Uh, here in the off season, people were looking to get him, and and but I think his heart and, and and first of all, the money that he's getting paid at Miami is is probably better than any other job in a group of five schools somewhere else. So, you know, a guy like Jason Taylor, uh, who was a big part of this staff last year, that I know the coaches really respect and Mario really likes a lot. I mean, he could be a guy who could potentially moves into one of those ten positions, but does he need to? Not necessarily. He could he could be in the same sort of position he was last year and still have a um have an influence on the players here. So we'll see um, what other changes happen uh, in the weeks uh, ahead. But again, uh, you know, it's not, we're not done. Like even when they hire receivers coach, I'm not sitting here saying Miami's done making yeah. adjustments. Who knows? Maybe, maybe field finally goes this year. Maybe Mario replaces him with James Coley, uh, who's coached tight ends in the past or another tight ends coach. Um, maybe he replaces guys on the defense or guys on defense decide to leave after they have a spring with Lance Gidry. You know, that's something else that could happen. They could all get together, go through a spring, and some coaches decide, look, this isn't for me. This isn't the system for me. This isn't the coordinator for me. And players are going to do the same thing. They're going to identify whether or not this system is fit for them and make a decision after the spring. Yeah. Um, Miami, look, to this point, we, and, we'll, and we'll start to evolve here and get to the to the mailbag questions here in a second because there were, there were some sent in that I think are going to lead us into some good topics, Carlos. But one thing I wanted to get into here was Miami's recruiting for 2024 because uh, Junior Day is March uh, the 4th. That's the, the first day of spring practice. So there's going to be a large contingent of visitors. Uh, Miami's only got one commitment so far in the class of 2024. I know some fans are a little like, well, what's going on? You know, you're not following it up with uh, another commitment, you know, a bunch of commitments. Florida State, I think, has eight. Uh, Florida has DJ Lagway as their, as their quarterback. What I, what I tell fans is, look, I think the commitment period is usually like between March and July. That's sort of the big window where you're going to land a lot of commitments. And then the reality is, is do you hold on to those guys? Do you flip guys? Um, you know, Miami has a lot of guys that they're interested in that are elite players. And, and from having some conversations uh, with people on staff, I, they're not at all concerned that they don't have any commitments yet. They're not pushing for it. They're they're sort of focused right now on fixing the coaching staff, uh, preparing for spring football, having guys get healthy so that they're available in the fall. Uh, you know, Mario wants to turn this thing around and, and going five and seven was was flat out just terrible in, in terms of, uh, you know, internal sort of feelings feeling good about this right you invest all this money into this program you have to start changing all these coaches and i think um you know no. Mar mario just wants to get this thing headed in the right direction so um you know the 2024 recruiting class can wait a little bit you're going to have guys coming on campus you want to see who's really into the really into this and i think a lot of those guys uh want to see this offense they want to see what shannon dawson does they want to see who the receivers coach is before they uh, you know, really wrap up their college decisions. Um, you know, I got an opportunity to go watch some seven on seven football here the last few weeks, Carlos, uh, Jeremiah Smith, um, jo jo uh, Josiah Trader, uh, Jojo Trader, uh, both Chaminade, uh, you know, standouts, the two guys I've been talking about for over a year now with you saying how important they are because of their connection locally. Um, you know, they're big time targets. They're very high up on the receiver board, but Je jo you know, Jeremiah, is uh, committed to Ohio State. He's been committed to Ohio State since uh, December. Eventually, uh, I think there's a chance Miami can flip him, but they got to play well this year. They got to show him on offense. You know, I think he's the kind of kid who could flip to Miami come October, November, December, uh, you know, sort of the way Mark Fletcher did, where he was committed to Ohio State for a long time, and then he flipped at the end and picked Miami over Florida. So that's what I think will happen with some of these local kids. But quarterbacks to keep in mind because that to me is always the most important position right those guys kind of build the foundation of your class they attract other recruits that air nolan kid um i went to go watch him play left-handed 6'3 about 195 pounds um he was one of three quarterbacks on the south florida express and, and when you watch seven on seven football carlos i mean you you can see some things about a quarterback yeah but the reality <laughs> is no pass rush all those other kind of questions I watched this kid's film and we're going to play his interview at the end here. For those of you listening to the audio version, if you want to listen to it, uh, those of you watching us on, on YouTube, uh, make sure you, you download the audio version of the wide right pod. But, you know, I talked to him for a while, super mature kid, um, 
studies quarterbacks, Tom Brady, Steve Young, Tua, you know, Tanga Vailoa. He, he's into studying left-handers. He wants to be coached by a coach who has some left-handed quarterback experience. My question to you, Carlos, as a guy who's been in there, how much of a challenge, if Miami's able to get uh, Nolan uh, to commit to the program, and he's, you know, he was wearing a Miami shirt the day I saw him <laughs> over at the 7-on-7 seven, seven, seven seven tournament. How, in your opinion, do you think it changes the offense at all, playing with a left-handed quarterback? Well, it, it changes a couple things. Like, one, one of the reasons why he probably wants to be coached by a guy that's coached left-handed quarterbacks before is because he, it's it's going to be more natural to be able to coach him and his steps and his, and his terms of his play fakes, his drops, his read progressions, from the way his body his angle, is angled to the field uh, and the way he gets into his drop. Because it's different, obviously, from left-handers to right-handers. And if you've only dealt with right-handed quarterbacks, it's going to feel kind of awkward trying to teach that to a left-handed quarterback. So that's something you have to be conscious of. Um, the other thing is now you you have to be conscious of your right tackle. Your left tackle is not now the anchor. It's the right tackle because that's now his blind side. So that's something else you have to be aware of when you're structuring your offensive line and putting that together. Um, and also those routes, sometimes left-handers tend to have a little bit more curve, a little more what you call a uh, – not a, a – Tail. A, the ball a tail tails. into it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something else you have to adjust with the receivers and be ready to do and be ready and be ready for moving into the season. So it's not only preparing the offensive line, preparing the running backs, uh, preparing your how you teach those progressions and those those play fakes and those drops, but also preparing the receivers on how to receive that ball from a left handed quarterback, because that arm angle is going to be different uh, when the left handed quarterback is in there as they're running their route. So they need to know where that ball is going to be coming from within the different routes. Um, I think it, it's it's important uh, to note. And I think it's pretty funny that Manny Diaz is probably pissing his pants right now, uh, laughing, because as you discussed, there's one commitment right now, right? In the 2024 class, we were in the same position a, a couple of years. Yeah, a, a kicker of all that. Not that kickers aren't important, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, a couple of years ago, following the recruitment of Cam Kitchens, James Williams, and that great class that Manny Diaz had, where were we sitting around June with yeah, this every, team? Everybody was worried. Because they had one commitment, right? Mm -hmm. Or just about. And to think that we are in the same position again, two years later, following the hire of Mario Cristobal and all the money that's been spent is pretty funny. I'm not saying that the program's not going in the, in the right direction, but to me, it's just kind of ironic that, you know, these wholesale changes were made with the football program and you're back to where you started from a couple of years ago. So yes, it's incredibly important that they succeed on the field early, uh, that they beat Texas A&M, that they have good showings offensively and defensively early on because they need that momentum to gain some recruits because the, the recruits need to see that it's different, man. It might be a different coach, but it's been the same result over the last 20 years. So you need to see a jump in this program. You need to see that this wholesale change, this gutting of the program, this new foundation that's being laid is actually moving forward and moving the program in a direction that it hasn't been in in a long time. If, it, if you don't show that early on, then they're going to be in trouble on the recruiting trail. And we're going to miss out on Aaron Nolan. And I do not want to miss out on that nickname every week. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's he's definitely high up on the list. I know he's visiting Clemson uh, March uh, 11th. He, he mentioned coming to Miami, I think, on March 23rd, uh, mainly because the coaches want to have him sort of one on one. If he comes on junior day, he'll just be one of a big group of kids. Uh, I think they want to kind of give him his own personal day on March 23rd uh, to come in and sort of get a tour. Uh, Ohio State wants him badly. Uh, I know he's high up on their list. Um, he's going there March 31st. He told me he's got a good relationship uh, with Texas A&M and with Arkansas. He likes Dan Enos, who, who of course, coached Tua. Uh, Dan Enos, uh, former Miami offense coordinator, now is over there at Arkansas. Some other quarterback names to keep in, in your mind. Malachi Smith. Uh, you know, look, some of these guys are not high up in the 247 composite right now. Doesn't mean they will be or won't be here in the weeks and months ahead. Malachi is a three-star um, I think he's ranked 419th right now in the composite 30th best quarterback. He's out uh, in San Mateo, California. Um, you got Luke Moga, who's an unranked kid, uh, 6'1", 195, um, uh, 6'2", 190 rather, from Phoenix, Sunny Slope High School, visited Miami with his father in January. I think those are the three top names right now for quarterbacks. Some other guys, Julian Sane, who's an Alabama commitment. He's playing for Team Raw. Um, I'll have a story on him, obviously, at Dylan Rayola, who's the number one overall quarterback. I'm sure they'd love to get him here, but probably going to end up at Georgia or Nebraska. He's got family on Nebraska. And then Michael Van Buren, um, who's another quarterback uh, who was playing with Team Raw. I saw him uh, in January, uh, plays at uh, St. Francis Academy in Baltimore. 
six foot one eighty uh five really strong arm I, I I talked about him I think previously on the podcast when 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 I did something uh, with Andrew Ferrelli talking about recruits so I think those guys are sort of their top quarterbacks um you know uh I eventually they'll get one probably in this yeah you and know. the thing is remember they just had a transition between offenses and quarterback right. coaches so right they have to get that restarted now and start re- reestablishing those relationships right. and maybe reconnecting with the relationships that Dawson had from Houston down here in Miami to see if those recruits still fit what he's looking for or if he wants something a little bit on the higher level yeah I mean and I think a lot of this is Mario driven Mario likes to shop for the uh, for the produce so to speak before uh, he starts cooking and letting chefs in there so he likes to buy the ingredients or or, or you know go out and, and recruit the ingredients that come to town some receiver names to to keep in mind besides Jeremiah Smith and uh, Josiah Trader uh, Ryan Wingo out of St. Louis uh, Missouri uh, five-star receiver Micah Hudson another five-star receiver uh, out of Texas uh, DeBron Gatling he's from uh, Georgia uh, Chance Robinson is out of here locally, four-star receiver out of St. Thomas Aquinas, big-bodied kid, 6'2", 190. All of these kids are over six feet tall, have big bodies. And then out of the Tampa area, T.J. Moore uh, out of T- uh, Tampa Catholic, he's 6'3", 190. He's only rated a three-star right now. But Mario doesn't really care about the star rankings when it comes to this stuff. Uh, some of these guys will eventually see their, their rankings improve. Um, but you know, quarterback and receiver, that's where I think a lot of Miami success is going to happen here in the years ahead. They've got to do a good job recruiting those positions. And then I think they got to follow it up with some more really good offensive linemen. And, and, you know, they've got guys on the radar, uh, Daniel Calhoun, um, he's, he's the number three offensive tackle out of Roswell, Georgia, uh, Gerby Lambert, another kid out of Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts, uh, offensive tackle, um, you know, 6'6", 280, Jason Zandamella out of Clearwater Academy International, Liam Andrews out of Brookline, Massachusetts, uh, Jameson Riggs out of Hiram, Georgia, 6'5", 285, offensive tackle. Um, yeah, I'm sharing just a few of these names because I want people to start, okay, who's Miami after? Who are these 2024 kids? Just want to share a few. I've got defense. I can do that on the next podcast. Uh, we can talk about some of those those guys and other positions, but – I know those are some names, you know, when, when people ask Manny, who, who are they after in this class? I think uh, quarterback, wide receiver are, are probably most important. And then safety on the defensive side of the ball. I think they've got to bring in some DBs. Um, you know, Cam Kitchens may not be here after 2023. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think they still got to get some more defensive tackles, too. They're going to grow that. Unit. Yeah. 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 So we'll talk about that in the weeks and months ahead here on the Wide Right podcast. I do want to get to the mailbag. Uh, first of all, Carlos, before we get to the mailbag. Um, happy birthday. I know I'm day early, but, uh, turn your birthday tomorrow and tomorrow, uh, what are man. you doing? Uh, probably doing a lot of taxes and then coming <laughs> home and passing out after smoking a cigar. That's pretty much the plan for tomorrow night. Okay. Saturday. We'll see what happens. Uh, Saturday evening. Maybe I'll do something Saturday evening, but I'm turning Brian Grant, AKA Bobby Humphrey, the big four, four. Uh, all right. I, I, uh, I, w- I welcome you to the 44 club. I've been in there. Since I appreciate June. it. Um, all right, let's get to some of these mailbag questions because I think they're going to let us lead us in the right direction. Um, uh, as I as I click, they on the rarely thread. do, they rarely do, but let's see if they do today. All right, this is from uh Andrew V17, one of our listeners, regulars. Um, do you like the new coaching hires? Would you consider them upgrades? And and the second question is, do you expect any other coaching staff changes? We've kind of touched on this, but um, which I guess I'll ask you this way, Carlos, which of the hires do you like most and which do you like least? <clears throat> um, you know what? Surprisingly, I like the Tim Harris Jr. hire a lot. I think Tim's a very good coach. He's grown up uh, through the ranks. He was a great high school head coach when his father went to UM uh, as a running backs coach, won a state title with Booker T. M. I think he won the national title when he was there as a head yep. coach, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is from a guy that didn't play football at UM but ran track and was a track Hall of Famer at the University of Miami. That goes to show you his knowledge of the game. He grew up around football with his dad. Um, really sharp guy. He's, he's a rising star, and to grab him as a running backs coach, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he gets uh, like a running a running game coordinator title attached to it, or something else, just to help elevate him a little bit more and have some more input into the run game, or just give him a little bit more money, which is really why those uh, coordinator titles get thrown around. But I think that's a great hire because of his ability as a coach and his ability to recruit South Florida, which is very important because he has deep deep ties in South Florida not just with, you know, Booker T, but, you know, with all the inner city schools, with the Pop Warner programs, he's well known, and that's going to be a great asset to have on the recruiting side. 
Um, as far as, you know, the ones, um, I, I don't think there's one bad one. I, I just don't, I don't see one that's, uh, the one, I guess Nicholson would be the one I'm least excited about just because I really don't know much about him. And he's, he went to Florida state. So those two things make it in uh, <laughs> bottom of the barrel for me. Right. Right. Um, not saying he's bad, but he is a seminal. Uh, listen, uh, Tim Jr. and I go way back. Uh, I actually covered him when he was in high school. Watched him play quarterback at Miami Northwestern. And uh, super smart uh, kid. I still call him a kid because he's younger than me. So uh, even even if he's in his mid-30s, I'm calling him a kid. Um, I think, you know, he's, he's a really good hire in the sense that he's going to help you in Miami's inner city um, with, with some players. And, and not that Mario couldn't do that either and go in there and recruit, but – um, you know, when you've got a guy who has that Harris family name and people know him, yep. it makes it a little bit easier uh, to go into some places where you might have um, some people who don't want to help you out because they don't like the University of Miami or they've got an axe to grind with the University of Miami. Yeah. And he uh, grew up with these people, these, that, you know, these coaches that are coaching yeah. the kids who are recruiting out. He grew up with them in the parks. He grew up with them in high school. He's played with them, played against them. He knows all of them personally. So it yeah. makes a huge difference. And, and and with Shannon Dawson, I would say he's the one that I kind of question a little bit only because, and if you listen to the podcast last week with Sam Kahn, he, he talked about it. I asked him, I put him on the spot. I said, how much did he really call the plays? Um, you know, he said he thought he called the plays last season, but throughout his career, he's been, and it's kind of like the same situation as Red Lashley, right? Like in the sense that when he was with Gus Malzahn, was he, he was really calling the plays or was it Gus? And, and how much does that really affect um, you know, whether or not you're ready for it. And and I would just say, you know, in terms of the air raid and Shannon Dawson, you know, he's from what I understand from Bruce Feldman, he's got a really uh, sort of colorful and fun personality being a Louisiana guy. Is that going to mesh well with Mario? Cause I know Mario really liked Josh Gaddis and they sort of, you know, I think saw eye to eye on a lot of things. Um, and we saw he, how that worked out. Right. <laughs> so we'll see. I, I guess that's the one I'm a little bit more concerned about. Um, I think, uh, Gidry is going to be a good fit here um, because from, from, from what I know of him and, and, and conversations I've had with people, including some of his former players, I think he's, he's one of those coaches that just gets along with players really, really well. Um, and I think his scheme is going to work in the ACC. It worked for Manny Diaz while he was here. The problem for Miami under Diaz was they, were, they weren't very good at tackling. They weren't very good at tackling in space. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and when you bring pressure like that, uh, you better be able to wrap up and, and not let guys get past you because if you bring the pressure, nobody else is home. So exactly, I think that's uh, that's going to be the challenge here. But I think he'll be successful here. I guess the one I question a little bit is Shannon Dawson, just because I, he's he's not um, he's not a Broyles Award winner. But then again, that didn't work out either. Exactly. Right? Again, the 180 we were talking about, and again, you know, even though there was questions about Josh Gaddis whether or not he called plays in Michigan uh, during the run to the playoff, um, but I mean, at the end of the day. It's exciting to know that Mario looked at what he had last year, decided, listen, the initial decisions that I made, the, the guys that I felt comfortable with didn't work out. Let me make myself a little bit uncomfortable and go against what I normally do, what I think, and go with what I think is going to work based on these conversations I'm having. Because this is the other thing that people forget. When he's having these interviews and he's talking to all these guys, he's not just interviewing them. He's gathering data. He's getting information. He's asking them, you know, what works for you on offense? What challenges you on offense? What works for you on defense? What offenses challenge you? What gives you the most problems? And he's taking notes and saying, okay, shit, air raid pass concepts give these guys the most problems. You know, a uh, power run game based out of, you know, 11 personnel with sort of the, the Malzahn look, which is pin and pull gap stuff mixed in with a little zone stuff and some quarterback run. That gives him the most problems because now you have to play 11 on 11. So he's registering all these things. And looking at different schemes and saying, okay, which two coaches can I pair together to be my coordinators to give the most problems to opposing offenses and defenses with their schemes, with what they do. And these are the guys that he came up with. Now, is it going to be an instant success? I don't know. Um, you know, it's it's going to be a challenge regardless of who's the, the coordinator, because you're going to have to rebuild this, this program from last year's debacle. But the good news is that some talent has been infused into the program, albeit young talent, some transfer talent. And that's going to take time to grow as well. But I think from a passing perspective, you're going to see a much different TVD this year because this is going to be a system that fits him better because TV did from what I've seen TVD from TVD over the last couple of years, he's not a guy that does well with multiple read progressions, right? With having to read across the field and read different progressions. He likes one, two throw quick throws, get the ball out quick, knowing to identify the receiver that he's going to quickly 
and the air raid does that for you, right? The air raid provides you with quick reads and the ability to get the ball to guys in space, what they call open grass. That's what the air raid's all about. If you dilute the air raid passing concept into one thought process, it is run to grass, run to where the open grass is, catch the football and go. That's the air raid. Um, and it's one of the more adaptable all passing concepts and offenses that there is in college football and in all of football, because you know where this offense started? It didn't start with Hal Mummy. It was the origins of this air raid offense started with BYU and Lavelle Edwards. That's where Mummy developed the offense from. And right. the initial air raid wasn't a shotgun four wide offense. It was two back, one tight end, two receivers under center. That's where it developed. So that shows you how versatile this offense is and how much has grown over the years. And the great thing about it is you could pair it with any run game you want because you can get to these same pass concepts no matter the personnel you have on the field. So it gives you more versatility. And that's what I like about what they've done here with the higher with Dawson and what they're supposed to be bringing in with the air raid and the power run game coming with Tim Harris Jr. from uh, UCF. All right. This is from Randall Carlson. He says, will the wide receivers coach be on staff by March 5th? Yeah, I, I would think uh, by March 4th, rather. Yes, there, there will be a wide receivers coach on staff before that. Mainly because they all got to go out and drink on St. Patrick's Day as a coaching staff to bond. That's right. Uh, this is from uh, Vic Vassell, Coach Vic Four. Who are your uh, breakout players for the spring? Uh, listen, I don't like breakout players during the spring because generally the ones that break out in the spring don't do crap in the fall. So I'm going to give you breakout players in the fall. I think Colby Young is very exciting. I think the fact that he's one of the fastest guys on the team based on those uh, miles per hour numbers we saw recently on Twitter. <laughs> right. Although it does concern me that the fastest guy on the team is Ja'Curry Brown. Um, that's a little concerning that your second string quarterback is the fastest guy on the field and we're not going to be using him all that much. So that's a little concerning in terms of the skill position uh, speed, but I think Colby young is going to be very exciting. I think, listen, this is put up or shut up time for Leonard Taylor. I think you're, you're, if you're going to see the best of Leonard Taylor, it's going to be this year because he's draft eligible. It's his time. He doesn't have Daryl Jackson next to him. He's got to step it up. So I think Leonard Taylor is going to have the best season he's had as a hurt. All right, since you brought up the list, uh, I got a copy of this uh, top 20 list. Um, Jaden Harris, the corner. Seamless transition, baby. Yes. Uh, there were two guys on the team who ran 22 miles an hour. And, again, this is just off-season testing that they do, okay? Jaden Harris uh, was number one, the cornerback, uh, second-year cornerback. Ja'Curry Brown, second-year uh, quarterback, 22 miles an hour, both of them over 22. Then you had – uh, Bobby Washington, close to 22 miles an hour, 21.96. He's uh, the wide receiver, freshman. Uh, freshman. Uh, Chris Graves, another Mario recruit, 21.78. Markeith Williams, 21.61. I don't know if you're getting a theme here. Uh, Devontae Brown, 21.52. Jaleel mm -hmm. Skinner, 21.47. Yeah. Colby Young, 21.31. Terry Roberts, the cornerback from Iowa. Back it up, Terry. 21.17. And then the 10th guy is finally a non-Mario Cristobal recruit. The first nine all Mario Cristobal recruits to Corey Couch, 21.16, followed by Brashard Smith, 21.14, Malik Curtis, 21.13, a walk-on, Jacoby George, 21.07, Henry Parrish, 21.05, Isaiah Horton, 21.02, another walk-on, then Chance Williams, 20.88, Daryl Porter, 20.84, and then Donald Cheney. 20.76 uh those are your uh 18 out of the 20 i'd say about i don't know 60 percent, 70 percent, maybe 80 percent are mario Cristobal yeah. recruits yeah so what does that tell you tells you not a lot of speed on the team before mario got here and uh we weren't recruiting it well so hopefully the the trend continues and, and there's a lot of guys still out in the spring dealing with injuries or coming back from injuries so that list should look a little bit different come the fall but still it's concerning to me that the number two guys, you know, it's great that Jacare is that athletic, but I would prefer receivers ahead of him and running backs and DBs ahead of him than the quarterback being number two. Well, especially I, the backup quarterback. I would say this: if Jacare can can really uh, get his throwing motion squared away and, and become more accurate, I would love lethal. to see him leading this court this offense. I think he's got Cam Newton type potential. Listen, and if it's going to like you're saying with the Cam Newton thing, this offense that with well, the offense that Gus Malzahn ran with Cam Newton is basically the run game that we expect to see, um, at least the the running back of it. If if you have a dual-threat quarterback like Ja'Curry Brown, you can then incorporate the power run game with the quarterback like they did with Cam Newton, which they ran a lot of what they call inverted power read, which is basically a quarterback power read where instead of reading the backside, 
He reads the front side end and makes plays that Cam Newton destroyed teams with that. And I think Jakari would be amazing in that. All right, this is a, another question from Coach Vic for uh, what is the strongest unit on the team? In your opinion, what do you think it is? And I'll go next. Whew. Good, good question. Um, safety. Okay. I think Just it's because safe. you have two front line starters. I think you have two front line starters. You got uh, an All-American coming back. I think James Williams is a very talented guy, and he could be a lot better this year with a little bit more fundamentals. Um you know, the quarterback room, I'm expecting TBD to bounce back. I love Jacur Jacurry Brown, what he showed last year. It's still uh, – the, the jury's still out at Emory Williams. You haven't seen him yet. I think the offensive line has improved a lot um, just by the additions of the transfers and the young guys in there. But I'm going to go with safety just because of the two front line guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't disagree with that. Although I, I would say I think the defensive line – I know they lost Daryl Jackson. I would say the defensive line is probably still the strength because you've got Akeem Mesador – who I think is is arguably your, your second best defensive player behind Cam, Cam Kitchens. You got Nigel Lee Kelly, who's on the rise, uh, yep. who I thought did really well in, in, in the few snaps that he played. You've got some veterans, Jafari Harvey out on the edge, who's played a lot, who's going to you know be solid for you. Um, you've got Leonard Taylor, uh, who, you know, when he's playing at his best can be really, really good. So I think the strength is probably the defensive line as a whole, even if you're still missing that defensive tackle, that elite, you know, big body defensive tackle. Um, and I would say the weakness, not that he asked this question, but the weakness uh, remains wide receiver because you need, you need playmakers. If you're going to run an air raid offense and be successful, um, you know, you got a lot of uh, guys right now that have to prove themselves, or as I, as I like to refer to them, uh, you know, uh, Don Bailey, all-stars guys that get interviewed, and we hear a lot about, and, and well, this guy's going to be great. Uh, I want them to graduate from being Don Bailey All Stars to uh, to All ACC type talents. And I think if they can do that, uh, then this team can win eight games. Right now, I don't know that they can win eight games with this roster. Yeah, and I think the offensive system is going to help the receivers out a lot because the air rate is designed for receivers. Right, it's designed for them to not only run. There's not a lot of pass concepts in the air raid, which makes it easier to digest and learn. But there are a lot of adjustments that you can run based off coverage within those passing schemes, right? Within those concepts. And the main idea, like I said, is get the ball to playmakers in space and let them go. And it helps you create matchup problems and take advantage of those matchups more often than you would see in a long progression type offense with multiple reads. And I think that's going to help guys like Rashard Smith, Xavier Restrepo, Jacoby George, where they're going to be running shorter routes, finding open areas, getting the ball in space and letting them go to work, which is what they do best. Um, a couple of questions here. Adam Fold sent one in uh, that kind of is a repeat of stuff we've already talked about. So thanks for sending the question in, Adam. But since we've already touched on a lot of those topics, we'll skip ahead. Uh, this is from Al Gauthier, uh, 508 Kane fan. The majority of recruits verbally commit during the summer with so many questions How, as far as how the offense will improve and the use of the wide receivers. How will this impact recruiting elite playmakers on that side of the ball. Well, I mean, I, I we, we kind of touched on that as well earlier, but to be to make it a little bit clearer, you know, th the main guys that Miami wants, I don't think are going to be affected by um, who is coaching so much as it is the success of the offense. Um, you know, first of all, Shannon Dawson has a connection with Jeremiah Smith. He coached uh, Geno Smith at West Virginia. Uh, Jeremiah is Geno Smith's cousin. And uh, so the Smith family is very well connected uh, to Shannon Dawson and know him and Gino, I'm sure will we'll put in a good word. Uh, the, I, I would also say for guys like Jeremiah Smith and Jojo Trader, it's the quarterback. What quarterback do they come in with? Do they get an Aaron mm -hmm. Oland uh, to come in this class? Do they get another elite guy um, that they feel like, okay, this is going to be our quarterback. I know from talking to Jeremiah um, about it, you know, he's looking at those things. Um, so yes, he's committed to Ohio state, but he feels the pull from Miami. I think Jojo Trader certainly feels the pull from Miami. It's going to be more about product on the field versus who's coaching. Yep. Um, all right, let's skip ahead to the next question. Uh, this is uh, from Miami Hurricanes enthusiast. Can we beat Texas A&M? Yes, we can. Will we? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think you almost beat them last year with this team, and you didn't really have much in the way of an offense. I think um, Miami could beat Texas A&M, but I would pick Texas A&M to win. Uh, because I think they're a better team. They've got more talent than Miami. They beat them last year. Uh, I think Jimbo Fisher is going to get things right. He's got the right quarterback. Connor Wiegman is very, very good. He's a five-star kid who played some at the end of last season. So he's not coming into 2023, uh, you know, cold or, or insecure in what he can do. Um, Bobby Petrino is a very good offensive coordinator. 
Uh, I think he's the kind of guy who can who can fix that offense. Oh yeah. If if Jimbo Fisher lets him do it. Um, go ahead. You want something else? And, to add? Yeah, and defensively, the one thing that presents problems with the air raid is if you have you know really fast defensive backs, great in coverage. Those are the guys. Or those those are the teams that, that give the air raid problems because they can lock up the receivers and follow them anywhere they want. And if they've got a strong defensive line to create pressure, that obviously makes the, the quarterback get the ball out a lot faster. And guys aren't necessarily open. So I think Texas A&M still has. Although they've lost a bunch of guys, a talented DB room. So that could be a challenge there as well. And they got a good defensive line. All right. This is uh, from Steven Thunder, 56 Blacks again on Twitter. One of your fans. Uh, how does Lito find the time to be a lawyer and podcast pro while simultaneously being the Miami maniac? And, and Steven, your check is in the mail. I'm making my weekly payment. Sorry, I'm behind a little bit. Um, like I answered him on Twitter. It's by being spectacularly average at everything I do. That's how I get it done. All right. Well, uh, Steven, thanks for always listening to us, or at least Carlos, um, <laughs> and, and being a, a regular contributor. All right, listen, uh, if you're going to stick around we, uh, in the audio version, make sure you listen to this interview with uh, Prentice Nolan, an impressive kid. By the way, 55 touchdown passes, Carlos, last season, four interceptions. Whew. I'm loving this uh, kid. 70 the only kid I would rank second behind him at quarterback is the Van Buren kid, just because I can call him El Presidente. <laughs> right. That'd be a great nickname. Uh, well, we'll see what Mario uh, ends up doing at the quarterback position, who they're able to convince to come. But some early names. Uh, we talked about the coaching hires. I'm sure there will be more Hurricanes news in the weeks and months ahead. Again, if you're listening to the audio version, interview with Prentice Nolan coming up. If you're not, you're watching us on YouTube. Sayonara. Peace.